seems like it has been a long time. Uh, the beginning of 2020 to make it to Bible study tonight. We're going to continue our series as there have been much discussions um, with me and the Holy Spirit and in uh, listening to others that one thing that the church is lacking in the body of Christ is teaching life principles. Uh, we often do a lot of teaching and preaching on being saved and, and filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, but even Jesus taught financial principles. Um, in fact, as I told you all to refresh your memory, Jesus actually spoke 16 parables dealing with finances. Uh, and I believe that's the body of Christ. Now, this may not message may not be for everyone but it can enlighten everyone uh, because everyone um, may not uh, be in this situation but we all have went through times and and we all may have our bank accounts may look good and everything but there are still principles <clears throat> that just one one life-changing incident can wipe out your whole bank account uh, uh, I often like to say we're just one prayer away from being in a poorhouse. Uh, so this is why we have to always remember uh, the thing. So we're talking about uh, breaking the financial hardship. One thing I want to X out again, remember, do not adhere or embrace these words about breaking a curse because if you are cursed, it's because you are still under the old regime, uh, according to the book of Galatians, say that he that hung on a cross became a curse for us. So if you're still under the law and you have not accepted Christ, then yes, you could say that. But if you have accepted Christ as your savior, the scripture says that you are a new creature. You know, and all things he said, not some, there's no way that, that, um, my life living as a Christian, let me see, I want to say that, is new, but my finances is still caught up uh, in the curse, as they, as they say, uh, you know, because of my daddy or my mama, you know. So you, you're either blessed or you're cursed. Uh, now, uh, when we look at what he told Abraham, he said, Abraham, because of you, this whole nation or this earth, rather, shall be blessed because of you. So, therefore, we have to understand that we are blessed. Most people only associate being blessed is that you have a lot of money. You know, you rich. No, that doesn't mean it. You know, sometimes being rich can be a curse. So, I want you all to understand that. So don't get caught up into that because I tell you false prophets will eat you up behind that. If you can feel that you are cursed and you have a, a family curse on you, uh, the witches, the warlocks, they will eat you up with that. And, <clears throat> excuse me, they will get all of your finances. If they can make you think that you're cursed, you have to know. And the way you know, you need to not know because someone said it. You need to study the word of God yourself and realize that if you accepted Christ as your savior. Now, it doesn't mean because we are saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, we're not going to have problems. We're not going to get sick. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have issues. All of that's going to be there. But the good thing about it is we have them with Christ. And he can bring us out. You got to remember now, the Lord was with Daniel and he allowed him to be put in the lion's den, but he was there with him. The Lord was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They was thrown in the fire furnace, but he was there with him. That's why the scripture says to give thanks, um, always give thanks for the things that you're in, not for it. But in all things, give thanks. That means I'm not thanking God. If, if someone dealing with cancer, you're not saying, well, I thank God for the cancer. Because it's been always said, well, before you complain about cancer and heart problems and all that, and go to asking God, God, why me? You ought to be saying, God, why not me? Get that out of your vocabulary. You know, what you should be able to do is, God, you know what, Lord, even in the midst of my battling cancer, I'm still going to give you thanks. Not for the cancer, but in the midst of me battling it, I'm still going to give you thanks. 
You know, so that's, that's the understanding I want you to get. So now back to this breaking financial hardship because I've told you many marriages have broken up behind that. Uh, relationships have broken up. Uh, you see in the news every day where either the husband is killing the wife, wife killing the husband, children killing parents, parents kill, killing children, and the investigators know exactly where to start from is that they look for the insurance policies, and most of the policies are a million dollars or more, and they start tracking from that and come to find out it was all put in place for money. So that goes back to what the Bible say, that money is not evil, but the love love of money so people love money so much now I want I want to take y'all I want to take y'all down a little road but I'll, I'll bring you back I'm, I'm your pastor follow me as I follow Christ promise you you won't backslide back into the world I'm gonna make sure you come on right back in the kingdom of God let's just step out for a moment and let's see what the OJ said they say for the love of money people will rob what huh Their own family, rob their mother, you know, they'll do anything for it. So the thing about it, now we're going to come on back. See, I told y'all, y'all will make it back. So the church have to know what do we do when there's a financial hardship. Most of the time when someone comes to a believer that's having a financial hardship, the first thing we tell them is, I'm praying for you. Hold on and trust God. Or we give them that hope. You know, it could be a false hope. You know, oh, just hold on a little while longer. You know, Lord, you show me your blessing is on the way. It's coming. God, no, no, no. Because first of all, you need to know what's going on. This person can be a person that has no ideal how to manage wealth and they just wasting it. Let's look at the prodigal son. You remember he took everything and went wasted it all on righteous living. And then when he became broke, nobody gave him nothing. He had to travel all the way back home. So the thing of it is, it's what we're doing with it. Now we're faced with this story tonight that we started this series last year. We was talking about it. How to break a uh, breaking financial hardship. Because where there's a lack of finances, then there's some hardship. And you need to know what the Bible says. The Bible say that money answer all things. Now, they can say what they want to say. People can say, well, money don't give me happy. That's a lie. Money make all of us happy. Because without money, you can't pay no bills. Without money, you know, I mean, what, what's your favorite food, Brother Troy? Chicken. Without money, what, what, which chicken is the best one? Church's chicken. I like church's chicken, too. The church's chicken. But without money... I don't care how much he like it. I don't care how much he walk in there and say, I like y'all chicken more than I like Popeye's chicken. I like y'all chicken more than I like Colonel chicken. Y'all have the best chicken in the world. I don't eat no other chicken, but church's chicken, woo-hoo, y'all are good. And now, can I have a two-piece? When he get that, they still gonna give him a bill. And if he don't have the money, well, you just another person that likes. So Bible say money answer all things. You know, it answers all things. I don't care what it is. If, if in relationship, if your, you know, my wife, if she want her hair done, if it ain't no money, nowhere to get her hair done, that's frustrating. And you can only brush it and put it back for so long, and perm and roll it. Even they get tired of rolling their own hair, getting under the dryer, and everybody else going. And you see them, they say, "Oh, girl, wait. Oh, I went to such such beauty shop. She good. How much she charge? Seventy five dollars. Okay." Ain't no money there, Troy. And they, they, you be wondering why when they washing dishes and all of a sudden you hear a plate slam down a little bit hard and you know you didn't do nothing wrong. She didn't heard that she want that hair done and there's no money to get it done. The Bible say money answer all things. It pays bills. It keep the lights on. It keep the water. It keep gas in your car. So there's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with money. And and listen. It used to be they, they taught the, the best Christian in the world and the real Christian in the world is that one that's broke and poor. You know, I'm just a poor soldier just waiting. No, that's not what the Bible says. See, so when you learn how to manage wealth, you can handle your financial hardship. See, you, you won't be the one standing up falsely clapping and shouting.
shouting and running when they say we're the head, not the tail. We above, not beneath. We the lenders and the barriers. You know, if you really listen carefully to most people, they get excited all the way until you get to that part of it that say we're the lenders, <clears throat> not the barriers. They get quiet because they don't have nothing to lend. So it had to have to be changes. I used to be one of those people until I had to make some changes. I had to learn about money. I had to learn about wealth. I had to watch what Jesus did and how they did in the Bible because the, the biggest frustration that men will face if they die away from this world and don't leave their family in a good position. Because the Bible say any man that take it not care of his family is worse than an infidel. You know, my grandmother used to always say, if you have to go pick up cans, go do something. And it's been proven, a uh, Korean guy that I, I had the pleasure of meeting one day, uh, every day his job was getting up at four in the morning, he'd come back in the evening with bags of cans, and at the end of the month, when he sell his cans, he had $1,500. So there, I told you all last week, you know, finding out what you have for all. And that's what the story tells us in 2 Kings chapter 4 verses 1 through 7 is that this woman had a problem. Now watch this. This was not someone in the world. This was, we would say, a Christian. He was a prophet, a prophet of God. Prophesying to people and telling them what the Lord said. Prophesying and telling the people the future and everything. He was a prophet, but yet, that's bringing us back to us. We are Christians, but yet we are, not all of us, when I say we, I'm speaking to wherever it falls at. We can be, because I was there before, we can be dumb when it comes down to money matters. Even Jesus told his disciples, you all need to go back to the world and you need to go back there and watch them because the children of darkness or the children of this world is more wiser that when it comes down to money matters than the children of light. You know, it's because we have, we have been told uh, and have been taught and have been put in our mindset, oh, we believers, we Christians, God going to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. So you don't have to do nothing, just spin, 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 and be happy and get all the stuff, all the stuff, all the stuff, all the stuff, be happy. That's a lie. You have to be wise with money, you know. Even and and then some of us won't spend nothing. Now you have to spend something. You gotta have to spend something. That's what keep the economy going. You know. And then you. But the reason why I say you have to understand how to manage wealth because there are some people who just won't. They're so tight they won't even buy a piece of bubble gum. And they putting everything up. And Jesus talked about that too. You know what 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 profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Don't become so so uh, addicted to just making money until you just feel I got to harbor all the money. That was one of the things we spoke about Sunday when when Jesus was talking about the young man that say, you know what, I'm gonna build me a bigger barn, you know, to put all my stuff in. So we have to balance. There has to be a balance. Even when the balance came, when they looked at Jesus and they told Peter, they said, your Lord, uh, he don't pay tribute to see. Jesus said, you know what? Peter, go fishing. First fish you catch, look in the mouth, get some money out and get some for yourself. And he said, give unto Caesar where the Caesar went unto the Lord, to the Lord. So now we to this story again uh, in 2 Kings chapter 4, the first seven verses where this woman husband was a prophet. Everyone shout he was a prophet. That lets you know, children of God, we have to learn money matters. He was a prophet, and he was a good prophet. He was a powerful prophet, but he was dumb when it came down to money. And, 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 and watch this. The Bible said he died, but when he died, he left a mountain of debt. And now here come the debt collectors. You do know it used to be said when you die, all of your bills is taken care of. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Because they'll tell you in a minute, daddy died. If he got some bills, they're going to be calling. They want their money. If you don't watch it, they will hold you accountable for it. He died, left his family in, 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 in just booming shackles. The money collectors came. They say, hey, you don't have our money? 
okay, here's the deal. Here's what's going to happen. Since you don't have our money, we're going to take your children. We're going to, and they're going to be put in slavery. In other words, we're going to get our money worth out of them. So she, she began to, to cry and weep. And the Bible said that she ran to the prophet. She ran to the prophet. Now her husband was a prophet. She had to go to the other prophet. And so he asked her, uh, Elijah, he asked her, he asked her what was wrong. She said, the creditors is at my house. And they're going to take my boys. They're going to take my children and put them in slavery. So what shall I do? That's why you need to always, you know, regardless. If I'm never here no more, God may call me to glory or may move me to, to Thailand or wherever. Hope you don't, God. But if that happens, whoever the pastor is, you have to trust if you know your pastor, trust your pastor. Well, if, you need to get to know your pastor. Trust your pastor so when you have those issues, see, here's the point of it is, and I sit back and this is what I observe. When people have problems, they go to everybody in the congregation or the neighborhood or the friends or the family for advice. And nothing never gets better. And by the time they come to the pastor, or we can say, preachers because all the ministers here are, are part of the of the of the clergy here but we are just saying the pastor for now by the time they come to the pastor brother Troy it's over with it's devastation there there's nothing can be done now they want the pastor to work a miracle what I'm gonna do and I tell them you know well here's a dollar go to Dollar General get you a few candles and a box of matches so when they cut off, light it up, and you have some light. Windows got screen on them, raise up the windows, you know. So the thing about it, look what she did. She didn't go to her family. She didn't go to her neighbors. She went to, now, why is it important that she went to a prophet? Remember, God assigns pastors to watch over the souls of the people. And he said in Jeremiah 3 and 15, I give you pastors to feed you with knowledge and understanding. Yeah. So she was in a position here that she needed some help. Uh, uh, now, he could have just thrown some money at her and say, here, but that wasn't going to resolve the issue. She could have walked away and said, man, I went to the prophet, told him my husband served him to the day he died. And my husband was faithful to him. And I was even, because the scripture says <coughs> that she was even there. Let's read it. Now there cried a woman, a certain woman, there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, that means it was a whole lot of them there. Thy servant, my husband, is dead, letting them know. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the, and the creditors come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Now notice, she could have went, and I don't know, the Bible didn't say she did, but I'm going I'm to go with the script. She could have went to any of the other prophets' wives or any of the other prophets. She could have called a meeting and say, hey, y'all, what can y'all do for me? My, my husband died, you know. But the Bible says she went to the pastor because you know this was one of his prophets she said thy servant my husband is dead so her husband was a prophet he was a servant unto Elisha and thou knowest and she, she said look you know my husband feared the Lord you know and the creditors come and Elijah said unto him what shall I do for thee right there he asking her what, what, what can I do for thee tell me what has thou in thy house and she said thy handmaid has nothing had not anything in the house save a pot of oil see some things most people do is they have a habit of just throwing we want to throw money at everything money do answer all things but some problems and issues just throwing money at it is not going to solve it I'll show you right what one point I want to make in the scripture. When he said, well, what is it I could do for you? She could easily say, well, if you just pay off the creditors, then my two sons won't be taken. That would have took care of that issue to pay off the creditors. But what about 
tomorrow, she still have to live. What about the day after that? That's still going to be bills. That's why I tell people, uh, when you pay off your house, I, I, I know, Brooke Clyde, if y'all don't mind me asking, y'all paid off a house before, right? Once you paid that house off, did that count? Uh, not, we're not talking about, well, we're not talking about the lights, but you paid the house off. Did that cancel any money that you didn't have to give no more money to that house? Still got to pay taxes. Y'all remember I told y'all about a young man who argued me down and told me I know what I was talking about and I was jealous because he paid the he for to pay his last note on his house and I say what you have never paid attention to was that eight nine hundred thousand dollars you paying every month only two hundred maybe three hundred is going to your house note <clears throat> everything else is called taxes he I didn't know what I was talking about because I'm still paying on my house and he fit to pay it off. Well, not long after that, I told him dollars and cents of what he's going to have to make sure that he have coming in this household every month so at the end of the year he can pay them taxes. And when he got through figuring out, he went home and come back, he had to come back and repent. He said, you know what, you show sure right, man, I didn't even know that. Why they lie and tell people you have been paid your house? Out? Well, you did, you paid off the loan. But what they didn't tell you is you're going to pay taxes until you're 65. And if you're planning on giving this house to your children, then I suppose you tell them or either you keep paying the taxes because when you stop the taxes at 65, it doesn't stop. Remember I told you all, same scenario. He died. But the creditors came, I say, because you get free taxes and you may get it until you're 75 and you die. When your children or whoever, if your children inherit this house, they're going to look for them to pay them 65, 70, 10 years of taxes. And if they don't pay them 10 years of taxes, then they're going to take it. So the thing about it is, here this woman is, she's saying, look, I, 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 now, now, and, and, and that's why I say as Christians, I don't think we as leaders and teachers have done the body justice. It's because we focus so much on telling them what you can get from God and save and sanctify. We need to be teaching, while you are living, we need to be teaching you principles on how to live. See, if you got a light bill need to be paid and you want a pair of shoes, don't get the shoes. You know, well, Pastor, I understand that. Well, let me tell you what you don't understand. Don't go get the shoes and then put the rest of the money <coughs> on the light bill. Pay your light bill. You already have shoes, but if you want to keep them lights on, you can walk out there with your oil. Here, I'll give you some. I got some right here. You can pour it all over your meter. That meter ain't going to be anointed. <laughs> All the, all the man going to do uh, is just come there, unhook it, wipe the oil off, turn it off. And you know what? No, they don't even have to do that no more. Right there from their desk, they just hit the button and snap, your lights is gone. You have to be wise when it comes down to money matters. You know, pay yourself. If you don't do no more than put, and I know it worked because I did it. You can put $20 every two weeks aside in stocks or something, or just get you a little money, a money box at the house if you have self-control. Because most people get put $20 in their payday and say, oh, I'm starting off with 20 I got 20 in there. And by, by two days later, they like, you know, I need that 20 I'll put it back payday. And yeah, you put it back, but now where the other 20? Because you should be putting 20 every payday. I did this for so many years. I put it in there every pay period. I was letting $20 go over into my stocks and bonds. When I left, let, let, me, let me tell you something. And I went to work every day. Here's what I want you all to know. My retirement kicked in at 50 years old. Okay? My retirement kicked in when I was 50. I quit my job when I was 48. When I had, but that's only because, let me get that right, because some preachers watching and saying, I'm going to do the same. No, this is something God was dealing with me for years, and I didn't want to do it. God had to really show me that it was him doing it. 
and I, I walked away. But see, I didn't just walk away and say, no, 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 no. See, I had money in stocks. I went to work every day. I had vacation and sick pay and all of that. So you have to plan this stuff. See, you have to plan it. And, and that's the whole part. So the thing about it, she said, what can I do? So he said, okay, <clears throat> what do you have? She said, you know what, I, I have, only thing I have in my house is, 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 is just a pot of oil. Remember I told you all this, you have shoes you ain't wearing. Troy, I still got that deal for you if your wife want to do it. Y'all, I'm going to pause for a uh, station identification. Right now it's a commercial break. Uh, Troy, I still have uh, those boots and shoes I was telling you about. Your birthday was when? Uh, yes, today. Yes, today, right? Yes. You know, how many of you got just just at least two or three of your favorite pair of shoes that you like to wear? If you had to make a choice, you only got a Few pair of shoes you like to wear. Let me see your hands. Now, how many, how many you have that your favorite ones, comfortable, that you like to wear? Three? Ten? Seven? Okay, now, how many? Somebody raise their hand over here. No, seven. Now, how many shoes you have total? Yeah. About 30. But she only liked to wear seven. So that's 23. So she come to me. She's this woman now. She come to me and she say, you know what? Your, your prophet is dead. And now I'm, how, how many pairs of shoes you have? 30. What's your favorite pairs you like to wear? I have seven of them. Okay, put them to the side and take the other 23 and sell them. Have a garage sale. Because guess what? It'll be better to have some kind of money because I already told y'all this last week now. I experienced it. And I know some of y'all have because I've heard y'all say, Oh, Lord, these old cheap shoes, they bust wide open, girl. You was embarrassed because they bust, but what you didn't tell the truth is you hadn't worn those shoes in seven years. And it's called dry rot. So if you don't wear them, they're going to dry rot. I told my niece, she liked to buy all of those high dollar purses, Michael Kors, this and that. And she had a closet stacked up with them. And I said, you know what? Uh, you worried about money for your down payment on the house. You probably have half of it, all of it right there in your closet. What do you mean, Uncle John? Stay out of my closet. I said, all them purses, you ain't using them. You don't think a purse or dry rot also? And start peeling? And then the next thing we do, we throw them away. So he told her, she said, look, I, I have this pot and some oil. He said, go and borrow. And I want to talk about borrowing now. Go and borrow these vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrowing not a few. Now watch this. It is okay to borrow. Watch this. To make a profit. But don't you borrow to pay a bill. It's a difference. See, if you borrow, if you say, you know what, Bishop Baines, can I borrow $200 to buy me a spot in the flea market because I'm going to sell my 23 pair of shoes I don't wear and Troy 10 pairs. And oh, because he made me mad, I'm going to sell that other one that he really liked. And I'm going to make some money. That's called effective borrowing. Because you're borrowing to make a profit. And that means you're going to pay me back. But now if you say, if I borrow $200 to pay my light bill, I'm going to tell you no. So why would I not lend my sister $200 to pay her light bill? Bishop, you are a horrible pastor. Shame on you. Her light bill need to be paid, and you wouldn't lend her $200 to pay her light bill, but you would lend her $200 to go and rent a spot to sell some shoes. Exactly. What kind of bishop would do that? A smart one that's full of wisdom. Why? 
if she borrowed two hundred dollars to pay her light bill, she not gonna be able to pay me back next month because she got another light bill. So why am I gonna stick my money out like that? But I'll tell her, yeah, I'll lend you the two hundred dollars to go and get that spot in the flea market to sell your shoes. Why? Because she's going to make, and I'm going to tell her out of the 23 pair of shoes, now you need to make sure that when you sell them, don't just sell them and say you happy you made $200, baby. You need to sell them for more than that because 200 comes back to me. And I'm going to want mine. You just been a got rid of your shoes. Yeah, because look, look what he, he tells the woman. He said, go and borrow, he said, borrow a lot of them, a lot of them. Go borrow vessels all abroad and bring them. And when thou art come in, shut the door upon thee and thy sons, and thou shalt pour, uh, pour out into all those vessels, in verse 4, and thou shalt sit aside that which is full. So he starts talking. Let me, let me tell you something. Let me drop this because y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. I, I, y'all probably missed it. You know, y'all pretty wise. But y'all don't understand what happened here. See, miracles are there when you are obedient to the word. Now, you have to understand something. If you go back, he asked her, what do you have in your house? She said, all I have is just a pot, one pot of oil. One pot of oil is all she had. So watch this. He tells her, go and borrow a lot of pots from your neighbors. Now watch this. And when you come in, I want you to shut the door. He gave her specific instructions. Come in, close the doors, and pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt sit aside which is full. Now number one, there's your miracle. She only had one pot with oil in it, but she went and borrowed all of these pots, and because she obeyed it, God allowed a miracle to happen because every pot was filled. It kind of almost sounds like the other part went on with the widow woman in Zarephath that fed Elijah, Elijah rather. Now this is a different miracle. This is Elisha, who was... Uh, a prophet under Elijah. Elijah did it with the widow woman at Zarephath and all he asked her to do was feed me. And she said, but me and my son going to die, feed me. She said, but you know what? At whatever you say, I'm going to do it. And God sent a miracle. Here's now Elisha and God sends a miracle because all of these pots are full now. Now watch what happens. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, you got to catch this, bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, there is not a vessel more. And watch this, what the Bible say. And the all stayed. Another word is stopped. See, if your capacity is not big enough, then the miracle will shut off. The miracle will content. Oh boy, right there. I got. Can I just have a little key right there and eat? And I'm not gonna hoop, but just to eat, just to uh, eat flat, like one of them preaching cards and eat. Yeah. See, cause y'all missed it. Watch this here. As long as she had enough pots, the miracle continued. When there were no more pots, and he told her in the beginning. You don't desire, see, watch this here. He told her in the beginning, in verse, in verse 3, when he told her to borrow them, what was the last thing he told her not to do? He said, don't borrow just a few. But she probably thought, oh, I, I have enough. This, this ought to be enough. Because she was probably looking at the pot and the oil she had and didn't understand. As soon as the pots, there were no more pots, the miracle stopped. What am I saying? When your capacity to believe and trust God is no longer available for God to show you his power, then it stops. It stops. You know. And that's why you have to dream bigger. See? You have to think bigger because you can't put your limit on God. It ought to be saying, you know what? 
Oh, you know what? Uh, Handmade Candy by Jordan Clark. Oh, you know what? I could get one store. Why not two stores? Why not three stores? Why not a franchise? Why not one in every state on the continent? Why not? You see what I mean? As long as you believe God and trust God and you have the capacity, God can do it. But God cannot continue a miracle where there is a limited capacity. Don't you know the Bible said that they limited God with their disbelief and, and miracles could not be performed. Even with Jesus, there were things that Jesus couldn't do. Not that he didn't have the power to do it, but it was because of the belief of the people. So you all been limiting yourself. You've been living in God. Oh, God, you know what? Thank God. I just got a job. I'm a security guard. Why not work to get your own company? Why not work to get a, why not believe God for a franchise? I'll tell you the reason why, Brother Darrell, we failed to do that. It's because we can't just believe and sit there on our fannies and think it's going to happen. No, you have to work to do it. See, don't ever think you just believe in it happen. You have to work to do it. Yes. Well, that's self-explanatory. That's, that's self-easy. Why would you believe for something that you don't want? I'm using that as an example when I'm talking about businesses. But I'm talking about the capacity of your thinking. It, it doesn't have to be a business. It, it's up to you. You know, but I'm saying when you limit God and you stop it, this what happened to the woman. The prophet told her, you go borrow and don't borrow it just a few. You go beyond your capacity of thinking. She probably was thinking, well, you know what? Wait a minute. This is all I have. Uh, that's all I could. No, find some room. If you got to take the bed out the house, throw the bed out the house, that's space. She could have put the jars under the bed, on top of the bed, stack jars on top. You, you, just capacity. The scripture says when there was no more pots, the oil stopped flowing. Verse 6, and it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her sons, bring me yet another. And he said unto her, there is not uh, uh, more vessels to all stay. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go and sell. Okay, let's do a flip on that. Let's say that you have done all you could do. Now you don't reach your capacity. She didn't just sit there. She went and told the man of God, okay, that's it. Everything is filled. Now he gives us some more instructions. He said, unto her that I need you to go now. And it came to pass when the vessel was full that she said unto her son, bring me yet another one that's not there and the all stayed. Verse seven, then she came and told the man of God and he said, go sell the all and pay thy debt. And live, this let you know, watch this, she had enough. And live thou and thou children of the rest. That means that she had to have a lot left because he never talked to her again about working, but he said, you and your children live on the rest. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed, and that, that's speaking about a whole other deal there. So now, remember, number one, when we were talking about these ten things, balance spirituality with responsibility. We talked about that. You got to remember you got to learn how to balance your spiritual life, spirituality with responsibility. You have to take responsibility. You know, don't just throw everything on, on God. You know, you have to develop your spiritual lives. Because if you develop your spiritual life without uh, developing your finances, then it's all messed up. Notice what John said to Gainus over in the epistle of John. He said, my beloved Gainus, I would that thou were prosper even as thy soul prosper. So not just spiritually, but also you have to look at this thing that is called responsibility, reality. You know? So now, let me go down to the next one. Uh, don't die in silence. Most time people say, how you doing? And Oh, I'm doing fine. 
and knowing that you're not doing fine, say something about it. Say something about it. I told a person, let me see if I can say this. I told a person one time that was having, this person was, was, was really having some issues. Issues, issues. And I said, you know what your problem is? Is that you're so obsessed with your disliking this person until it's making you miserable. And you need to revamp your thinking. That person is happy. So don't die in silence. This woman told the prophet what was going on. And thank God that his wife refused to let what killed the husband kill her. Because there had to be a lot of stress knowing he owned these creditors. And they owned him every day. And he's trying to preach the word of God. But at the same time, I'm trying to preach the word of God. But I got these creditors on my back. No, it don't work. It don't work. It used to work, but it don't work no more. We used to tell your children, I tell them I ain't here. Or you won't answer your call. Now they'll send somebody out to knock on your door and leave this envelope there and they call it a, a judgment against you now you can't get a car you can't get a house you can't get a loan and the pastor gonna check your credit too and I'm not gonna when you stand up and testify and say my credit is so bad I can't borrow a dollar from the pastor to get a hamburger I'm a, I'm a witness I'm gonna say amen <laughs> pay your bills pay your bills Pay your bills. I know how it is. Pay your bills. Because let me tell you something. People, I know, I know that ain't good grammar. Something. That's just shortcut for something. Y'all do know that, right? Okay. So now watch this. What people don't understand is the Bible say that a good name. And I, I, I thought about this. <clears throat> a good name is far better than riches. You can have money, but your name not good. What do you mean your name not good? You can have money and got a messed up name with the creditors. Because people have money don't mean they have good credit. That's why most of them have to buy stuff cash, you know, because, because they have money, they think they can just get credit and not pay their bills. You still have to pay it. And then by the time they get all, all like whatever, like, yeah, you know, you're doing this, I can buy you, I can buy you. Here you go, take this money. And they'll go ahead and pay it. But guess what? That ain't going to get your name out the credit bureau seven years. Pay your bills. And if you don't nothing else, know nothing else, let me help you with this. That bill may be $75 a month. If you can't pay the 75 pay something on it. As long as you pay something on it, it's showing you're paying something. Get your names together. Get your names together. Good name. Pay your bills. Pay them on time. You know, if you don't pay bills on time, uh, you know, and you know you have the money, that means that you are slowful. And God don't like slowfulness. And most of the time as believers, we put a bad name on the kingdom of God. That's why the world be looking to say, oh, you, you, you church people is some of the worst ones to deal with. Y'all won't pay y'all bills. And y'all talking about how good God is. I might need to go to God and tell God tell you to pay your bill. This is a true story. I don't know if these people are Christians or not, but I'm going to say this. Well, you all won't try. If you go get something from renter center, it is not yours. You are renting to buy. Until you pay it off, it still belongs to who? So don't go take them people's stuff and pawn it in a pawn shop. This is a true story. It happened. I'm telling you, we, as believers, we got to clean this stuff up. Number three, choose the right over covenant. Even though you need money urgently, don't go for everything that is convenient. Go for what is right. And again, don't use a credit card to pay a bill. Because now what you're going to have is that bill due and now you got another bill due. I, I, I'll give you a little, a little, a little economics here, money, money management here. If I have a large purchase that I know I'm, I'm getting ready to do, and I have the cash money, 
I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna do that that makes sense. It help you out. If you got y'all already know this. I know y'all already know this. But if I got a large purchase, I'm gonna make if it's a thousand dollars or three thousand dollars, and and I just saved up the money and I have the cash money to make it. I'm not gonna pay it cash. Now I'm gonna take my credit card that gives me the most points and I'm gonna charge it. And once I charge that large sum on there, then I'm going to immediately, notice I didn't say when, I'm going to immediately, because we have to know our flesh, take that money, pay it. And even if the credit card say you have no payment at this time, if it's not registered, I'm going to still pay it on there because it's going to show a credit, but by the time that bill hit, it's wiped out. Now I got points. You can use those points to travel. You can use them to fly. You can use them to shop. All of that. I'm telling you, I got like over 4,000 points I haven't even used yet. It's called smart money management. And this is what we have to do. Uh, where my time at here? I want to make sure I don't run over. Okay. All right. Listen. Uh, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. But, but we're going to continue this by breaking financial hardship. Because that's where the saints need to be. And, and, and pastors need to teach this because if they, and this is Bible. If, and, and everybody may not need it. But there are some that need it. And most pastors won't have those frustrations when they can't meet the bills of God's house if they teach people shouting and dancing is good and then, oh, we had some church and the Holy Spirit visit today. Well, you should have blocked the doors to keep the Holy Spirit in there because by the time you got ready for offering, you didn't get but $5. So you shouldn't have, you should go and complain it, because the Holy Spirit ran out before the offering was. The bills still have to be paid. You know, so you have to understand that, people of God. You have to have to teach them. Parents, you need to teach your children that. Teach them that, and they won't be coming back home six months later when they moved out. Or they won't be coming to you saying, I don't know what I'm going to do, mama. My house note is due. I, ain't got, I don't have the money. Well... Billy lost his job, and it's kind of hard. But wait a minute. You, you just went out to eat with the Antoines, and I saw your bill. You and Billy spent $150, and then the weekend you went out to eat with uh, uh, Lily, uh, uh, Lily for her birthday, and you bought her a gift, and you ate, uh, and, and then... You fit to go on a cruise with the Johnson? Oh, no, baby, I'm sorry. i tell you what you need to do. Before you do all of that, go and get you a storage and put all your furniture in there so when you come back off the cruise, y'all can sleep at the storage. It's just it's called teaching good money management. That's what I tell people. Don't keep at the, It don't make no sense to keep asking God for money and you keep waiting. God don't waste. Jesus told us that in the prayer, but when the prodigal son did it, he went wasted everything. So he went back home. He said, I'm in the higher service my father have that have bread enough to eat. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back home and I'm going to tell my father, I sinned against you and you only have I sinned. I'm no longer worthy to be your son, but make me your higher servant. The good thing about it is when we mess up in life, God never demote us from son or daughter to servant. He keeps us as son and where others... Talk about our dirt. God covers us. You know, so remember that, okay? All right, God bless you.